that we landed at Omaha Beach, and of course, there were huge numbers of vehicles and tanks and things, and we waited ashore. There was no fire when we landed. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've been prepared for all of this, but you, you really never know what it's going to be like until you get there, until somebody's there trying to kill you. Yeah. And we walked up the beach and uh, up the hill to go inland. And I saw about eight or ten American soldiers asleep on the ground. And well, they were dead. Wow. That's the first time I'd ever seen a dead man. Mm. And I said to the boys, okay, fellas, this is where we're going. It seemed real then, I bet, huh? Right then and there, you suddenly know what you're going into. So, I mean, I guess probably they had, you know, the, the, the toehold of the Allies was big enough that there was no direct fire coming at you, and they might have, you know, done some mine sweeping on the beach, and so oh, yeah. you were able to kind of move out there, you know, relatively assured that you're not going to You could hear the firing. Oh, really? Okay, so it's that close that yeah. it, was, it was still audible. And I imagine the beach was probably littered with, you know, Everything. tanks and... Everything. Uh-huh. Supplies and tanks and barbed wire. And, um, and so then, you know, what happens? Do you, do you set up an encampment or do they well, send Well, we moved you inland. To, uh -huh. And I would guess we must have marched you know, two or three miles and set up a, a, a base camp. Mm -hmm. And I think we were there a couple of days. And then we were given orders to move ahead. And uh, the 9th Division had been one of the assault divisions in the uh, original invasion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took over their positions, their, dug their foxholes. And they were relieved. And uh, I think we stayed there maybe one day or two days. And then I got orders to report to the battalion headquarters and got an attack, got an order to attack the next morning. And uh, there was a little town, uh, slipped my mind, but there was a railroad ran in front of it, and uh, we were to jump off at 6 in the morning. And uh, I called, I came back to my command post, and uh, I called my lieutenants to the other first sergeant. And this I'll never forget. And you never can tell about a person's uh, reaction to uh, an emergency, well, not an emergency, but uh, a uh, difficult situation. And my first sergeant had been a very tough kind of a guy who kept the men in line, probably would have knocked their heads off. And I gave the order to attack. And he said, I can't go. He didn't have it in him. Wow. What sort of intelligence did they give you? Uh, and, you know, what was your task? Was it just, you know, you guys with your guns going We were going given there a mission to, to take a, uh, a church area, uh, maybe a half a mile away, mm -hmm. and we were to go forward uh, with two platoons abreast and one in reserve. And uh, we did, and we got pinned down with very heavy fire. Was that expected? Had they given you intelligence that said, listen, that we estimate there's 500, they just said 500 Germans off. in that town? Or, they uh, didn't know what to expect. Okay. And um, we did. We, we started out at 6 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we got pinned down immediately with heavy fire. And uh, there was a road that came up in my sector, and all of a sudden, out of a clear blue sky, who comes down the road in a jeep but the colonel, the regimental commander. 
I don't know what the dickens he was doing down there, but he got shot. <laughs> Killed? He was court-martialed later oh. for being up there. Uh -huh. But he got badly wounded. And we were all pinned down, and here he comes down <laughs> in this jeep. Sort of anyway, MacArthur style, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we moved ahead. Uh, it was a pretty tough fighting and actually lost quite a few men in that first battle. Mm -hmm. But um, we called for artillery and uh, got some tanks up there, and we were able to keep moving forward. And then we just uh, would take a position, dig in, and wait for further instructions. And so the mission of the division, we were in the first army at the time, uh, the mission was going to be to take Saint Lo. The city of Saint Lo was the uh, anchor point for the German defenses. And uh, we met sporadic resistance as we kept moving forward. And when we finally got, oh, I'd say within a quarter of a mile of Saint Lo, we were on a ridge overlooking the city. And I'll never forget, they told us to dig in and uh, to put uh, luminous panels of material out in front of our front lines. Uh, this is so that uh, the bombers would know not to drop any bombs this side of the panels. So we put our panels out, and at, at about 8 o'clock in the morning, I'll tell you, I've never, I'll never forget it. There must have been a thousand American airplanes that came flying over there and just, they just devastated that town. They just dropped bombs everywhere and dropped some on us too. But <laughs> that couldn't be helped. But uh, they virtually annihilated the town of St. Lo. Hmm. And then the next day we were given an order to move in and the Germans had moved back. So we were able to get into the city. Was, did you encounter any resistance when you got into the city? Was there any no, house, there wasn't. house fighting or anything no, like that? No, they had backed out. But uh, I'll never forget, I was so tired. And uh, there were still some houses uh, standing. And uh, we took up positions in the town. And I went into a house, and there was a bed with a mattress on it. Well, you always had, the, when you're in combat, the thing you were always afraid of was what they call these trip wires, because they had uh, what they call a bouncing Betty. If you hit the wire, there was a, like a grenade that shot up, and it would disembowel you. Yeah. And as you're, you're first in combat, you're looking everywhere you walk before you step. You don't want to step on one. After a while, you know, the hell with it, you know, if I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. But here was this mattress, and I thought, oh my God, I haven't slept on a mattress in so long. I'm going to sleep on that mattress. But then I thought, well, gee, maybe it's booby trapped. You know? <laughs> if I get on there, it'll get blown up. But I just said, the hell with it, I'm going to jump on the mattress, and I slept. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we were there for, uh, I think, a day or two. And then I was given orders. Was there any of the local French population around? Oh, yeah, you were. Yeah. They came out. They did. And I imagine they probably had left the city when the bombing they had. was happening. And yeah. when they I, knew that it was clear. Yeah. But then we were how given they, orders. How did they greet you? Were they, were oh, they, they just... Oh, they love us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, were they, I imagine they're also, they must have experienced some, you know, post-traumatic oh, stress. Oh, terrible. And, and I'll have to tell you that my unit uh, is still, I mean, there, there are not many of us left, mm -hmm. but they have reunions periodically. And the people from St. Lo come to our reunions. Mm. And they say, we will never forget you. Mm. They decorate the graves of my unit every year on Memorial Day. Mm. And they say, if you come to France, you are our guest. You stay with us. And their kids are the same way. Hmm. They don't forget. Amazing. 
But then we were given orders to proceed to, the Germans took up positions along the river called the River Veer. And my unit was actually at the head of the regiment. And uh, it was a few days after that, that that we hit just terrible resistance. And we got thrown back. We'd gone from a uh, kind of an elevated area down through a valley and came up on the other side. I'd sent scouts out and they said everything looked okay. And we came through there and just hit a terrible fighting. And uh, what we was had the nature of it? Was it guns or tanks? Oh, machine or guns mortars? and yeah. artillery and mortars and everything. Uh, it was a, a uh, defensive hold for the Germans to move back. Mm -hmm. And so we had to fall back to the other side of the uh, valley and get some tanks and some, uh, some help and artillery to go back in there the next day, which we did. And, and, and that's when I got terribly shot. Mm -hmm. Do you mind telling um, how this happened, how you worked? Well, uh, I had my communication sergeant with me, the radio man. And uh, you know, when you're given an attack order, you're given a, what they call an azimuth. It's a compass reading. You have to go along that route because hmm. there are other troops that are going along their route. You don't want to go this way and that way. But uh, in Normandy, you have these, what they call hedgerows. They don't have fences there. These are hedges that could be four or five feet wide that have been there for centuries, and you have to go through them. And uh, the fields are on the other side of the hedges. And uh, so we were going through, and I was out with my communication sergeant. I'd, you don't know exactly where your troops are. They're all around you. Mm -hmm. And we came through there, and the Germans were on the other side. And the next thing I knew, I was down on the ground with a, a bullet hole right through here. Sergeant took off. And uh, I was down on the ground. I saw this bullet hole here, and I thought, well, that's the end of it. But fortunately... What, uh, what, what did you do? Um, I mean, I don't, you know, it sounds like you weren't raised in, like, a religious household. I mean, did you pray, or were you just sort of reflecting on Well, I on think your <laughs> life, every, they always say just... that there are no... There are no atheists in Foxhall. Yeah. You say, God, if you're here, help me. Yeah. You know? But I was on the ground, and I mean, the thing that was, it, it's almost like a, a story. I was going into the battle after the first day, and I had used my, you have an aid packet mm -hmm. on your belt that you use that has bandages and sulfur fills and one of my sergeants had lost his arm, and I had bandaged him up. And we're going into this battle, and one of the privates came up to me. He said, hey, Captain, you don't have an aid pouch. And I said, oh, I won't need it. He said, I've got an extra one. You better take it. And it saved my life. Wow. So you administered first aid to yourself. Well, I was able to, uh, you have a little shovel in the back of your pack, mm -hmm. and I was able to take the shovel and get down into a, a little ditch and kind of get down far enough because the guy who had shot me was still over there. How far away was he? Oh, maybe 20 or 30 yards, okay. pretty close. And so I, I, there was still stuff coming at me, mm -hmm. and I was able to get out of the line of fire and stay in that little ditch. My men couldn't get out to get me at that point, but uh, several hours later, they did uh, get rid of the uh, the fire, and they came out with a a raincoat and rolled me over and put me in the raincoat and crawled out to uh, the road, and the medics were there, and uh, they 
they gave me the plasma and put me on a stretcher and we started to go back to the uh, where the headquarters were and the Germans at that time had uh, they had been there a long time and they zeroed in on these roads with artillery and mortars and these these uh, stretcher bearers were carrying me and uh, the fire started to come in on on the road and they just they dropped me in the middle of the road dive from the ditches <laughs> they'd hear the stuff coming in they picked me up and run 10 yards and drop me again <laughs> i thought what a terrible way to die out here in the middle of the road i couldn't move anyway they kept pulling me out and finally uh, we got back to the aid station and uh, there was a jeep there they put me on the front of the jeep and uh, they took me back to the field hospital and they put you on a some kind of a machine to see if you have any shrapnel left in you, a metal detector, I guess. And that was the last I remember. And then I woke up, I guess it was maybe two days later. Well, prior, prior to this, it sounds like you were uh, uncon or conscious. The I whole was time. the whole time. So I imagine at a, at a certain point, you know, after seeing that yourself that you were shot, and where it was, you probably thought that it was over, right? But then, you know, time passes. Well, I and put you're I like, put the aid packet okay. here and here on the other side because the bullet went through me mm -hmm. and through my lung. And well, you know, you do what you can. That yeah, was all you could. And yeah. Well, clearly you didn't you didn't give up immediately. Oh clearly no. Clearly you. You never give up. Okay. You know, you're fighting for your life. And then I, I remember waking up and there was a, an army captain sitting on my bed and I said, where am I? And he told me, he said, you're in such and such a field hospital. I said, am I going to live or die? He said, you're going to live. He said, we got to you fast enough that we could save your life. And I imagine the danger would have been blood loss at that point. I guess so. Yeah. How did how did you feel when the captain gave you the news that it looked like you were going well, to Well, I was through? so I was so thrilled. But then the thing that I was worried about was my mother and dad. Yeah. Because uh, they wouldn't allow you to write or or to phone or anything. And I thought, gee, whether well, my parents were elderly, they get news that your kid has been shot. I thought they might have a heart attack or something. And that's another story. Yeah. But uh, I was in that hospital for several days, and then they had a uh, an ambulance plane that flew me back to London uh, to England. But I was full of tubes and stuff coming all out of me. I didn't know what was going to happen, but you know, all you can do is follow orders. Sure. And they told me to, what to do. And it was, your, your, your fate sounded like it was pretty much out of your hands at that it point. It is, totally. Yeah. And then uh, I, I was in the hospital in a town called uh, Linster. And I had, I had only one friend in all of the European theater that I knew where I could locate him. And he was a colonel in the Air Force, in the uh, Eighth Army, uh, Eighth Air Force. And I sent him a penny postcard, and I said, I'm in the hospital in Lemonster, and if you could ever get over here, I sure would like to see you so you could contact my folks. Mm. And a few days later, the fighter plane came roaring down over the plane, and over the hospital and these guys coming out, the fly boys, you know, they had whiskey and beer and everything. <laughs> they came in and I really fell apart. I was so happy to see them. And they said, well, we'll call your, your folks and tell them you're going to be okay. Wow. And so I was uh, in that hospital for several weeks <coughs> and then they said, you're going home. 
that I, I couldn't go back to duty. Yeah. And so I was sent to the uh, Baxter General Hospital for chest injuries in Seattle, in Washington. And uh, I stayed there for several weeks, or several months. And then I was uh, okay to go back to limited service. And they transferred me back to Fort Hood, Texas as a plans and training officer. And then I was uh, appointed to go to Command and General Staff School at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas as a student. And uh, I did very well in the program there, and they asked me to stay on as an instructor. So I was still a captain at the time, <coughs> and I was training field officers, majors and up. And it was fun. Gee, I could get out and play golf, and just, all I had to do was teach a few hours a week. <laughs> and then the war was over. and. Uh, they came to me and said, we'd like you to stay in the Army, take a, a full commission here. And I thought, I think I've had enough of this life, <laughs> and I'm going to go back to San Francisco. And so I, I opted out, and mm -hmm. there I was. Hmm.